Hello and welcome. In example three, we're asked to find the intervals on which f of x equals x to the one-third times quantity x minus four is increasing or decreasing. And then also we're asked to find all points where f has a local max or a local min. Now since it's the same strategy for both finding intervals of increase and decrease as it is to find local maxes and mins, we don't have to do too much duplicate work here. Uh, we can use the same results to answer both questions. Now as a first step, I'm gonna pre-process the function. I'm gonna do a little bit of work to make it easier to take the derivative of that function. What I'm gonna do is distribute the x to the one-third into each of these terms. That'll make it so that we avoid having to do a product rule. So x to the third times x is x to the four-thirds, right? Add the exponents, one-third plus one gives you four-thirds. And then minus four x to the one-third. Now we can take the first derivative, and it's much easier. Multiply the four-thirds in front, subtract one from the exponent. Multiply the one-third in front, subtract one from the exponent to give you a negative two-thirds. Now here, we're gonna to want to take a step of simplification before we try to set this equal to zero or figure out where it does not exist. And this step might be a little bit tricky, but just hear me out. We're gonna factor out as much as we can from each of these two terms. Now that'll involve a four-thirds. There's a four-thirds in common, that one's pretty clear. But we're also gonna factor out an x to the negative two-thirds. So four-thirds and x to the negative two-thirds. We're gonna factor both of those out. Now it may seem very strange. How can you factor out an x to the negative two-thirds from each of these terms? Well, factoring just means you're gonna divide each of those terms um, to figure out what's left over after you factor out the, the GCF. Um, I don't know if it's exactly called the GCF here, but whatever you factor out. Uh, so we're gonna take the, the original term here, 4 thirds x to the 1 third, and divide it by 4 thirds x to the negative 2 thirds to figure out what is left after we factor out. Because, you know, after all, if we turned back around, we would distribute, in other words, multiply this back in. Um, so taking going this direction, we're gonna be dividing to take something out. Let me do that work off to the side. We have 4 thirds x to the 1 third divided by 4 thirds x to the negative 2 thirds. Well, the 4 thirds cancel, and you just get x to the 1 third over x to the negative 2 thirds, which is x to the 1 third minus negative 2 thirds, which is x to the 3 thirds, which is x to the 1. So factoring out the x to the negative two-thirds was great because all we have for our leftovers is just x. And then all we have for the leftovers of the second term is one. So factoring out the x to the negative two-thirds really helped out here. In fact, if you factor out the, sm the smallest exponent that you see, so if, if you have x to some power, x to another power, if you factor out the x to the smallest power that you see from these terms, then this trick can uh, sometimes help quite a bit. Now to simplify one more step, we're gonna write, leave the four on the top, the x minus one is also on the top, the three is on the bottom of the fraction, and that negative two-thirds is gonna bring the x to the negative two-thirds down as an x to the two-thirds. So now we've got a nice simplified version of the first derivative, and it's ready to do the analysis that we need to do which is figure out where that first derivative is equal to zero and figure out where that first derivative does not exist. Well, as mentioned, if you have a fraction and you're trying to figure out where is this fraction equal to zero, the only way a fraction can be zero is if the top of the fraction is zero. So when we look at this fraction, four x times x minus one over three times x to the two thirds, that fraction can only be zero if the top of the fraction four times x minus one is equal to zero. And that happens at x equals one. And then the place where the first derivative does not exist, well, that can happen if the bottom of the fraction is equal to zero. Three x to the two thirds equals zero, which would happen at x equals zero. You can divide both sides by three, raise both sides to the three halves power to kind of get rid of this, this uh, fractional exponent, and you get x equals zero. So those are the two x values that we have to consider when we're thinking about intervals of increase and decrease and local maxes and local mins. 
So let's take those two x values and put them on a number line. Here's x equals zero, here's x equals one. It doesn't have to be drawn to scale or anything like that, just make sure to put the numbers in order. Make a row for the first derivative. And we said that at x equals one, the first derivative was zero. x equals one, the first derivative is zero. And at x equals zero, the first derivative does not exist, is d and e. So we can label those in our first derivative row. Now we just need to figure out the signs in, of the first derivative on each interval. So we could take some uh, x value like negative one and plug it in. We'll do that scratch work off to the side. f prime of negative one. And here we're gonna get, well, we have a positive four. I guess I'll write the four as a, positive, a separate positive there. And if we plug a negative one into x minus one, we'll get negative. What's the sign of the bottom gonna be when we plug in x equals negative one? If you said it's gonna be positive, that's correct. Why is it positive? Well, it's because this two up here is an even number. You can think of x to the two thirds as x to the one third squared. So no matter what the sign is of x to the one third, you're gonna be squaring it and that's gonna make the number positive. Or if you thought about x to the two thirds as x squared raised to the one third, then the same thing happens. Whatever value of x that you plug in, if it's positive or negative, it doesn't matter. You're gonna be squaring it and it'll be positive. So in the end, the bottom is always positive and that's because of that even uh, number in the, the numerator of the fractional exponent. That seemed very long to say out loud. <laughs> All right, so a positive times a negative over a positive is negative. Is the sign going to flip as we cross x equals zero? If you said no, that's correct because the corresponding factor, the place we got x equals zero is the x to the two thirds power. And we just said that that's not flipping signs. That's gonna stay positive no matter what. I mean, it's good to stay positive, right? So it's not gonna, but again, fortunately, that means that the first derivative is gonna stay a negative as you cross x equals zero. Oh well. But in the end, it's gonna end out positive because as we cross x equals one, x minus one has an odd exponent, so it'll flip the sign of the first derivative and we have a happy ending. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> So then if we wanted to draw our little pictures of uh, the ups and downs, if the first derivative is negative, what does that say about our function or the graph? You said decreasing, that's correct. So it'd be decreasing on this interval as well. And then when the first derivative is positive, the graph is increasing. So we can immediately write the intervals of increase and decrease. Looks like it's increasing on the interval from one to infinity. That's where the first derivative is positive. And then decreasing when the first derivative is negative, which happens from negative infinity up to where? If you said one, that would be correct. If you said zero, that's also correct too. And you could break it up into two intervals if you wanted to, negative infinity to zero and zero to one. But notice that at x equals zero, the original function is defined. So we don't really have to break up our interval because the, the, the graph continues on even through x equals zero. And it's gonna be decreasing on that whole interval from negative infinity all the way up to one. So this is unlike that vertical asymptote that we had a couple of examples ago at x equals two where we had to skip over two. We had to take the interval from zero to two and then two to four. Uh, here, we can just take the whole interval from negative infinity to one, and that's because at x equals zero, the function is defined there. There's actually a dot on the graph, and that means that uh, we don't have to break up our interval into two, two intervals. So there's the intervals, those are the intervals of increase and decrease. The only other thing we have to do is find the local maxes and local mins. And what do you see here? If you said there's a local min at x equals one, that would be correct. So one comma three. 
uh, 1 comma negative 3. By the way, I'm not writing local, but it's implied here. If you just say that there's a min, that means a local min. So to find the, and, and then also to find the y value, you can plug in 1 back into the original function. So let me just write that there as a reminder. The negative 3 is coming from f of 1, not f prime of 1. f prime of 1, we know exactly what that is, that's 0. But to find the y coordinate of the graph, you always go back to the original function. One last note. You might see the book or uh, other websites and things talking about this thing called a critical number. So I wanted to let you know what that is. A critical number uh, is an x value where the function is defined. So uh, here the critical number x equals c. Uh, is a, so c is a critical number if the function is defined there, so f of c is defined, and the first derivative is 0 or the first derivative does not exist. Basically, the critical numbers are just the candidate x values where you might have a local min or a local max. Also, they're the candidate x values where you might be changing from increasing to decreasing or vice versa. So the key thing though about the definition of the critical number is not only that it's a place where the first derivative is 0 or possibly where the first derivative does not exist, but it also has to be a place where the function is defined because only when the function is defined can you possibly have a local min or a local max. So that concludes this video. Thanks for watching and see you next time.